Okay, so welcome everyone for this week's machine learning coffee seminar. Uh, this week we have a, we have a speaker from Unity Technologies. So Mikko Kempan is going to talk about automated game experience personalization. So welcome everyone. Uh, if you have any questions during the talk, uh, please write them in the chat. So I will then read them aloud for, for the speaker, and then we will have we should have plenty of time at the end of the end of the presentation for more lengthier questions. So Mikko, please go ahead. Thank you for the introduction. So, indeed, hi everyone. My name is Mikko Kempainen. Uh, the title of my presentation is Automated Game Experience Personalization. So, let's get started. So, first we will overview GameTune. Game, GameTune is the name of our product that uh, does, does all this personalization. So, in a nutshell, what GameTune does. Uh, it in a, in enables developers to personalize their mobile games for players. Is my is my connection okay? Okay, just froze froze at this end. Okay, so let's. Let's move on. So uh, indeed, we are uh, enabling developers to personalize their mobile games for players. Uh, uh, the aim is to optimize to improve metrics like uh, uh, retention, so that's like engagement, or uh, player lifetime value, which is more of like on the monetization side of things. So how GameTune is integrated to the game? So developer sets up a question together with a small number, let's say two to ten alternatives. And from these, these alternatives, GameTune will then choose in, in real time upon request. So that's in a, it's a nutshell how, how it works. So I have two uh, use case examples here that I'd, I'd like to consider throughout the presentation. So the first one is uh, just first time user experience. It could be, for instance, tutorial length or, or difficulty. So, so the, just the first time when the player starts playing the game, we make a decision. On, on, on this tutorial length. And uh, this means that we will end up maybe making just one decision per player. Uh, typically, this kind of uh, question might optimize for retention. So will the player come back in, uh, in, in one day or three days or, or, or seven days? So that's a typical optimization target for, for this kind of uh, first time user experience uh, uh, question. Another typical use case could be ad frequency. So how often to show interstitial ads? So interstitial ads are, are something that are shown, let's say, after, after you complete a level or, or something like that. So how, how often to show those? So if you show them too often, maybe the player gets annoyed and uh, or too, too few ads will not bring much revenue. Basically, this kind of decision is uh, reasonable to make in the beginning of every gaming session. So this results in multiple decisions per player. Uh, typically, this kind of use case would optimize for LTV, so that's the, uh, the lifetime value. By lifetime value, we, we simply mean that uh, we combine the revenue from, from different sources, so revenue from ads and, uh, and in-app purchases, so combined. All right, so what's common to all these personalization problems is that uh, whenever you're predicting human behavior, there's always a great, great amount of this kind of sort of like aleatoric uncertainty. So that's depicted here on the left side. Here we have a, have a, have a distribution. So somehow we can never know for certain, let's say, what, what will be the lifetime value of a player. The best we can do is we can, we can uh, provide some kind of probability distributions that, that, that describes the, the expected. Uh, LTV. Uh, the second uncertainty comes from uh, making decisions with limited data. So of course we don't we don't have unlimited data, and uh, and and this this entails some some additional uncertainty. So here on the right, this uncertainty is with the parameters of this value distribution. So the location parameter, we might be quite uncertain of that. And uh, we might also be uncertain about the scale parameter. So, so that's the two kinds of uh, uncertainty that uh, are, are very much present in our modeling problem that we have to tackle. All right, so one decision per player. Let's, let's take a look at the first, first use case example that I was uh, describing. 
if we start with just non-contextual decisions so let's not let's not personalize at all let's just make smart decisions for for uh, all users so recall we are we are uh, modeling retention uh, retention means that uh, we are we have a zero one label so this is just classification basically and uh, the value distribution that we would then have is uh, simply the Bernoulli Bernoulli value distribution so basically this solution is summarized in this box in the beat the Bernoulli bandit this is this is of course very very standard so so we have the Bernoulli likelihood and uh, we combine it with the let's say uniform prior so then we can analytically deduce that the uh, the posterior that we have in this situation is just a beta beta distributions with parameters alpha and alpha and beta where alpha are retained players and, and beta is the number of churn players so all in all there's no numerical uh, fiddling going on here it's all all analytical and uh, very nice okay so that was that was uh, one sort of individual alternative so let's look at the situation when we then have let's say three three alternatives like here on the right uh, on the left sorry so uh, so let's say we've uh, uh, reached uh, three posterior distributions for the three different alternatives and we somehow have to make a decision based on these distributions so i mean it's not immediately clear uh which one of these would be the correct one or the, or the best one so so instead of trying to guess that we simply ask for each alternative what is the probability that this alternative is the best one so this process is called thompson sampling and uh, what it gives us it gives us this kind of decision policy that we have here on the right so so according to this decision policy uh, the probability that alternative two is the best seems to be the highest so this would be the sort of uh, distribution of answers that we would then serve for for uh, players if we did not take context into account but of course we want to take context into account because we are this is all about personalization after all so so how to how to add this context then so we can of course now uh, try to predict these latent parameters so in this example the theta parameter for the, for the likelihood so we can try to predict it for each alternative by some kind of parametric model let's say a, a neural network model for this we of course we need uh, we need features features of the player and uh, the, which which whichever uh, relevant things so this leads us to a uh, naturally to a supervised learning setting recall that we we are only making one decision per player so so we end up uh, trying to solve this kind of um, classification task. Very standard, of course. Uh, well, when we only have little data, we would somehow like to, like to let's say, converge or, or, or continue from this, from this non-contextual setting that we just uh, presented here. But somehow we have, to, we have to be able to include this uncertainty here. So typically, of course, the, the parametric models they don't they don't say anything about the certainty of the uh, of the weights or the uh, outcomes so we have to include the, this sort of epistemic uncertainty somehow so the solution we are taking is using these variational layers and variational inference so let's take a quick look at with the at the math how the, how this how this all works out so basically we have our network with the weights w so let's let's put a standard normal prior for all the uh, all the weights so then we want to deduce or somehow uh, approximate the posterior distribution here so so indeed we cannot solve this analytically so what we can do we can uh, we can try to approximate it and how we approximate it is is with uh, this this sort of well another set of normal distributions let's call them q and how we approximate we minimize this this uh kulbach leibler divergence so it's uh, the, the formula is here so we take the expectation with the proposal distribution of the uh, log proposal minus the uh, uh log the uh the posterior but of course here i mean we're trying to solve this posterior so i mean like this formula as such is not very helpful because 
we don't of course have, we cannot plug in uh, the, the the posterior here because that's what we're trying to solve so we need to expand this uh, term here and uh, of course we can get rid of all the uh, all the terms that emerge that don't uh, refer to w at all recall that we are we are trying to optimize uh, with with w so what this uh, reduces to uh, it reduces to optimizing so-called evidence lower bound or in more detail minimizing this quantity the minus minus elbow so if you look at this so here we have the kubuk liber divergence qp and now both q and p are normal so this first term is is very nice we can compute it analytically and uh, and that's uh, that that's it and the second term here that's that's just the uh, uh, expected log likelihood that's of course we would include that in the model in any case so i guess a simple way to to uh, do the expectation here is to simply to do this monte carlo approximation take take n uh, samples and, and take the average so that's certainly something that uh, can be done and is, is tractable so what does this lead us to it leads us to leads us to a, a model for the latent parameters that then uh, that then includes this sort of epistemic uncertainty and we can we can do this thompson sampling from 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 that uncertainty as we did with the with the non-contextual model and indeed it does converge to that non-contextual model when when features or data are limited or alternatively if the network regularization is very high so it converges to that in the sense that the, the policy that we derive from these approximate posteriors will quite accurately match the one derived from uh, from the uh, beta posterior so here i've included a small small uh, plot from our tensor board so so indeed the difference between the learned policy which is the which is the policy from the variational network versus the uh, exploration policy which is the uh, non-contextual policy so you see with with sufficient training the difference between the i, I mean this is the uh, uh, total variation di difference a total variation distance between the between the two policies so that uh, shrinks uh, to almost zero all right so I, I included a couple of references here that have been helpful for for, for working and understanding this so I guess weight uncertainty in neural, neural networks is a, has been a very helpful paper for us. And personally, I've enjoyed reading this, uh, this review article for, uh, that, that quite well describes this kind of, um, uh, this kind of uh, stuff. All right, uh, that was one decision per player. And we managed to, uh, we managed to include the epistemic uncertainty in the in our decisions and that's that's that so let's uh, move forward let's look at the second second use case example that we had so that you recall that that was the uh, the at frequency case where we where we make the decision in the beginning of every gaming session and we end up making multiple decisions per player so uh, the image here is not exactly about the uh, at frequency I, I think it's about some kind of level level difficulty balancing but let's let's not worry about that so first of all we are recall that we are modeling ltv lifetime value of a of a player so this means that our labels they will be continuous and i guess non negative as well or positive so a natural value distribution here would be indeed the log normal distribution or as we will later use a quantile distribution is a different way to parameterize a more flexible way to parameterize uh, uh, basically any distribution. Uh, then the second point here is maybe the important point is that uh, indeed because we're making multiple decisions per player, the right modeling framework is no longer supervised learning, but it's uh, it's reinforcement learning. So so the point here is that we will be collecting. Let's say there's a reward window of of, of seven days or something, and we are making all the time every day we're making decisions within this window so of course if we just look at the total ltv that that the player has has brought then we cannot 
directly attributed to one of their decisions, obviously. So, so somehow this reinforcement learning will, will solve that kind of like a ambiguity for us. Uh, one word about this uh, value distribution before we move forward. Uh, so lifetime, lifetime value distributions are, are always quite heavy tailed. So recall that the, the LTV consists of uh, uh, ad watches, so they can be interstitial ads or rewarded ads. So basically they bring like a steady stream of very, very small, small revenue. So everyone watches ads. But the, uh, the heavy tail, that comes from IAPs. So IAPs are quite scarce. IAPs are in-app in purchases. So, so they are quite scarce, but of course they are much more valuable than, than individual uh, ad views. So somehow this uh, choosing the right value distribution is not, not uh, uh, completely trivial. So I guess a log normal distribution is okay, uh, but it could be that the data is actually bimodal. So then you see that the log normal, I mean, it's not very flexible. You cannot, you cannot really make it into a, into a bimodal distribution by any, any choice of these latent parameters. So uh, in our case, it is more flexible and better to parameterize it with, uh, with, with quantiles. And we will talk about that uh, a little bit more later. All right, but let's, let's take a look at the RL concepts that we will be referring to here. So this box basically contains all the, all the formulas we, we need. Uh, so by R we denote the immediate reward after taking action A from state X and before taking the next action. So this is, this is what, what happens between, between actions. Uh, then uh, given a policy, we can define this, this return distribution or, or future rewards distribution, however we like to call it, but just summing over the discounted immediate rewards. And there's of course some amount of, let's say, stochasticity going on here. So, so the, the next state will always be chosen or, or, or sampled from this, um, uh, this transition kernel. Uh, we don't have to worry about this too much because we, we won't be modeling this transition kernel in our, 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 our work, but, but it, it is there. So there's a certain amount of uh, uh, randomness coming from there. And then of course, there's the, uh, the, the randomness of choosing the action. So, so the policy need not be like a deterministic policy. And what we're eventually interested in, we want to find a policy, pi, that maximizes the uh, expected discounted return. So we call this Q. So that's the, that's the Q, Q value that we will be referring to. All right. So I guess a by now very well-known approach to this is, is called Q learning where you only deal with the expectations of things. So I, I've said Q learning in discrete state space. Okay, maybe that's, uh, maybe that needs a little bit of clarification. So, so all, all I mean here is that, that we're not doing any approximations. We, we are thinking that we could basically run these algorithms for just like loop, looping over, over state space uh, times actions. And recall also that actions for us is also always uh, just a finite, finite set, two to 10 actions. All right, so in, 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 uh, in this kind of setting, we can find the, uh, the optimal Q function or the action value function by repeatedly applying this, this Bellman optimality update. So let's take a look at this update. So we are updating this Q function here by the uh, expected immediate reward plus the uh, expected Q value from the next state, given that we always take the, the, the action that brings the maximal Q value. So that's the, that's the, um, the simple Q, Q value Bellman optimality update. And uh, as the story goes, uh, this is a contraction in the sup normal when you take the sup over, over uh, X's and A's. And then we can use some uh, abstract machinery called uh, Barnack fixed point theorem to say that this kind of procedure will always uh, converge to a unique fixed point. So that's very nice. And of course, I said that we were looking for a policy, but uh, as soon as we find an optimal uh, Q value, Q, Q function, action value function, then we can simply follow this kind of arc max policy, so to speak. So we always, so we always pick the action that brings the highest Q value. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. 
So then how about, how about continuous state spaces? So now we can no longer think of like looping over all, all uh, states. As you can imagine in our setting, so for sure we have like a, the, the, the state space is quite uh, large and certainly, certainly of continuous kind. So uh, here we need to approximate this action value function somehow. And well, we do it with a, with a, with a neural network. So here you see the uh, QW is our parametric model for the Q function. So the algorithm goes basically like this. So let's say we've, we've frozen parameters from an earlier iteration, and then we want to, want to uh, update or, or, or learn the new improved parameters or, or weights here. So how we do that? We fix a target. So you see this target is exactly as, as from the previous slide. So it is the immediate reward, the discount, and the uh, Q value at the next state where we pay, pick the uh, one that brings the maximal, maximal value. So this is a target, and then we simply regress the uh, model towards this. We, we step, to, step through the uh, uh, elements in our training data set and, and, and minimize the distance. So I guess here we're only speaking of floats or real numbers, so square difference is a, is a perfect, perfect distance here. So I, I included one reference here. So this Atari paper is, is, uh, is where this was described very, very well, I, I believe, for the first time. Okay, but uh, can we, I mean, we've talked a lot about uncertainty. So can we take this uncertainty into account somehow more, more carefully? Uh, here, this picture, it could be a, a, a value distribution or let's say the, the data, data from value distribution. And you see that the, the mean here doesn't necessarily uh, describe this distribution very well. So indeed, this distributional RL approach will allow us to, to take uncertainty into account more carefully. And we will be making these, these sort of, these so-called Bellman updates directly to the distributions. So that's the, that's the trick. So now the first line here is the distributional Bellman optimality update. So you can compare it to the, uh, the, the Q value update that we had just in the earlier slide. So we will be updating this return distribution by uh, the immediate reward and plus the, uh, the return distribution at next state. And then we'll be following a, a policy here. It, and this policy derives from, from, the, uh, from the Q value, so the expectation of, of Z. So basically this could be ArcMax or, or, a, or a SoftMax policy. So this is, uh, I would say, like a direct analogy of the, of the Q value update that we were looking at before. So then I guess the question is, uh, could we follow the, a similar kind of reasoning as we did before? Is this uh, distributional optimality update a, a contraction in some metric? And I guess when we say metric, we need to somehow think about how should we measure distance between two distributions. So these are no longer real numbers or, or, or floats, but they are, they are distributions. So we have to like think a bit more carefully about the, how, how, to, how to measure the distance. So there is, a, there, there is a suitable tool for that. So the Wasserstein distance will help us with that. So let's, let's not look, look too deeply into this. Simply, when we define the P Wasserstein distance for two distributions, we look at their inverse cumulative distribution functions and then take their LP, LP distance, like here. We can also de define it for, for uh, P infinity, but uh, I guess we won't be needing this here. So recall that these U distributions were just the Z distributions at fixed state and action. So of course we will need a metric for the, for the Z distributions as well. So here we can simply take the soup of the, uh, of the Wasserstein, Wasserstein distances. So that's our proposal for a metric that could make this, uh, this update a contraction. Well, is it a contraction then? So the sort of 
positive positive news is from another update, update operation let's say this policy evaluation update update operation where we keep the policy fixed let's say we we have a policy and we want to we want to uh, sort of find the return distribution that describes that policy so we could be doing this kind of update taking the immediate reward and uh, and the return at next date next action according to this fixed policy and this update is actually a contraction in this metric so uh, that's good news uh, so it means that we're we're on the right track and uh, we can certainly use it for something but uh, the the unfortunate fact is that the, this optimality update that we are after is actually not a contraction in this metric so so if you compare these two the difference is that here the policy is not is not fixed but we, we sort of learn the policy as we as we go so so q is the expectation of z and we sort of like this this keeps on changing as we as we go so it's it's not a contraction so we cannot directly say that okay so everything everything works but uh, uh but we have to have a more careful argument we won't go into that argument but basically an optimal policy does exist and if it is unique then these uh, then these uh, updates converge to it but it need not be unique so that's the that's the story there so here's a just the conclusion that the theoretical so sort of, this is theoretically sound this this approach so, and there's a uh, a crucial reference okay so we need to do this in a continuous state base, state space then so we do as before we have a parametric model for the return distribution and we need to we need to somehow somehow learn this so let's say again we have frozen weights from an earlier iteration and we define this target so here again there's the immediate reward and and then there's the return distribution at next state given this this policy that we follow and this policy is again it's it's derived from from q so okay so we have a distance so Wasserstein distance is a good distance for uh, for uh, for distributions but but we need to somehow parameterize this distribution like we cannot deal with abstract distributions you know, like that we have to somehow parameterize it how we can parameterize this is the uh, the given by the quantile approximation so let's look at distributions that are composed of like, identical dirac masses at distinct points and we can define for any distribution a projection a quantile projection to this set of distributions and what what is how this projection is defined let's say that it it minimizes this uh, one Wasserstein distance so p is p is one here and a handy fact is that uh, given the inverse cumulative distribution function these quantile locations are uh, given by the midpoints of these let's say these these evenly spaced quantile levels so a picture here would be very helpful but uh, but uh, trust me this is this is quite uh, quite quite nice but but uh, what we need is a loss that we can minimize with stochastic gradient descent and uh, a suitable loss is actually this kind of quantile loss minimizing this will lead to ve these very same uh, very same uh, quantile locations so so that's very handy what is what is in here so this is an asymmetric loss so depending on the quantile where we are looking at it it treats over and under estimation differently depending on that quanta so basically that's a that's a that's a that's a loss that we can use for our uh, gradient descent so then uh let's get back back to the uh, to the algorithm so recall that our target distribution was given by by this so let's say z prime and uh, how we learn this parametric model is that we simply minimize the quantile loss to 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 this target distribution so if we translate it to the uh, notation of the previous slide so we will be parameterizing this distribution by a number of quantiles and 
the loss that we would then be minimizing looks like looks like this. So that's solved then. So so then we are minimizing one Wasserstein distance and parameterizing with these uh, quantile points. So what is the benefit here? So now you see that the, these quantile locations or parameters are are able to capture this this kind of uh, bimodality or multimodality even even if uh, if uh, it exists. So I will take a couple more minutes to finish finish the slides. So conclusion about this section is that uh, indeed we can learn the quantiles for this uh, return distribution from context also in this uh, continuous state space state space case. Here are a couple of references. I won't go into them in more detail. Uh, let's just say these implicit quantile networks and these fully parameterized quantile function are two approaches that uh, uh, are more advanced. They, uh, they, they add more, more parameters to the, uh, to the quantile distribution. I want to finish by answering the question if this all works. I guess briefly one can say it does. Uh, simply by by judging judging how game tune is doing so so most of our customers are getting getting positive lift that's for for us of course is is the is the let's say the uh, uh, the most important thing but maybe from the point of view of uh, data science we also want to like convince ourselves that this also works works as we as we meant it to work so we have some uh, some simulated environments where we can where we can look at these training processes and how they how they look so in homage to a classic, classic video game we've called one of our simulations Plumber's Dreams. So you might be familiar with, 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 the, with the plumber, plumber video game. So Plumber's Dreams add frequency. In this simulation we choose between these three add frequencies and we've set it up so that if you, if you give the wrong add frequency then soon after that decision the player will churn. And what I've, what I've uh, included here is a histogram or, or distribution of the target, target distribution. I've plotted it as the training progresses. So maybe, maybe you start to see a little bit of bimodality here. Maybe this is like a stretching it a little bit, but, uh, but, but indeed, these need not be, let's say, normal distributions. They, they, they indeed have, have some kind of like shape to them. And I guess this is at least some indication that parameterizing these distributions by quantiles instead of just the mean could be the right, right way to, to uh, move forward. That's all. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the really interesting talk. Really, really cool stuff. Uh, any, any questions out there? Uh, you, you can raise your hand or, or write in chat. So it seems that we already have a question from, from Sakira. Uh, okay, so maybe I can read it aloud. So uh, what is your opinion about if we measure the difference of the distribution using KL divergence instead of using Wasserstein distance? And then there is a second question. Can we use a policy network like deep neural network to approximate the set W? Well, uh... I will, I will answer the first, first one. For sure you, you can use it and I, I believe it has been used, this, uh, this KL, KL divergence has been used for the uh, uh, di distance for the distributions. I cannot quite remember the, uh, the, the references and the results, but I believe it is not the, the, the operation that we were describing, the policy evaluation update and the uh, optimality update. I, I believe they are not uh, contractions in this, in this metric, but I, I might be mistaken. If I remember correctly, they are not contractions. And the second question was if we've used policy networks, um, we, we haven't tried that, no, no. We are, we are like, a, somehow this Q-learning approach, uh, of course, we are, we are developing this sort of organically so that we didn't use to have reinforcement learning, but we, we used to only have supervised learning. So, so somehow this, uh, this uh, reinforcement learning was, was easy to build on, or this Q-learning Q approach was easy to build on the, uh, the, 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 what we had before the code base. So we are, we are not building anything from sort of scratch, but evolving organically, let's say. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, Anna has a question. Uh, how do you use domain knowledge? Okay, uh, very good. So, um, so basically, uh, every game has its own model and every question in the game has its own model. This might sound a lot and I guess it is a lot, so we have a, we have a ton of models, but that allows us to, uh, to use just game specific features. And these are something that the developer themselves, they provide. So, so they, can, they can send a number of coins the player has collected, uh, levels completed or whatever, like a, sort of like a game specific uh, features. And these, of course, can be very helpful. So, so that's the sort of, I hope I, I managed to un answer the question. So that's the sort of uh, developer provide domain knowledge that, that, that we can use. Of course, we have like a ton of data at Unity and, and we can sort of like, we can, we can create all kinds of embeddings from, from that data. But uh, that's, that's basically how we, how we do. Sorry, but uh, developer provide you with data. Yes. But the main knowledge is something uh, that you that some manager tells you that in this game it's important to see how much money people paid in this game, how often they completed the game. So do you use that? Do you collaborate with managers? Uh, no, no. Okay, okay. So uh, maybe I should go back to the title. So uh, automated game experience personalization. So so if I may emphasize that automated there. So we are also trying to solve an auto ML problem. We don't want to manually fiddle with any of the models. So uh, so you can imagine if we have uh, at some point when we scale up like hundreds or, 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 or hopefully thousands, I don't know, studios integrating their games. So, so most certainly we do not want to like manually mm sort of input any so any knowledge or, or domain domain knowledge so so we want to make it make it so that uh, it's it's automated okay thank you okay and we have a question from from petri would you like to ask it yourself or should i read it yeah petri here maybe oh, if you hear me yep so uh unity is, is a leading leading gaming platform i'm just curious that how technically you measure when the game player does something during the game or a lot after the game because there was an ad. How do you measure that? Well, uh, game tune works through these, these, these number of events. So, so actually the events are very similar to, to what was described with the, with the, uh, in the reinforcement learning, uh, concepts slides so basically we re receive these reward events i guess the game developer who integrates game tune can choose to be quite imaginative with the rewards so i guess like if they want to be just to, to do the the simple thing then they send a reward for every ad watched and every iap purchased and and so on but i guess in principle, you can you can be more in imaginative. So you could you could send rewards for all kinds of activities that the, or, or things that happen to the player or, or conversion events or so on. So uh, our framework certainly uh, makes makes that possible. I guess that's not the most uh, common um, uh, common integration that would use these kind of very very imaginative rewards, but it's possible. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, so also Ignacio has, has a question. Would you like to ask it yourself? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, yeah, I was interested about the simulator you mentioned at the end. Like, how how do you use it in your flow? Is it just to validate that technical, like the, the implementation works, or is it also a way to to kind of uh, measure the possible lift it will have in such a use case. Also interested if you have like more than one simulator or is it just like this one? Well, we, we have a couple of, couple of simulations. So uh, um, uh, the, the idea for us is not to, not to try to make like a realistic simulation. Of course, like that would take a lot of resources to try to somehow like come up with uh, mimic human behavior in, in, in games and we, we don't want to like 
we, we don't want to put resources into that. Rather, these simulations, the point of these simulations is to pinpoint one aspect of the model. So for instance, that, that at frequency simulation that I showed, it specifically addresses the sequentiality of the decisions. So you remember I, I was describing these rewards, these immediate rewards and this future return. So in this simulation, you cannot tell from the immediate reward if you did the right decision or not. Rather, you will have to look into the future if that decision was right. So that's that's like, I would say that's like pure RL. So if, if you can, if you can uh, judge if the decision was right from the immediate reward, then you can use supervised learning and, and that's it. That's the, that's the story. But if the, if the immediate reward doesn't tell you that, then it's, it's uh, pure, pure RL. So, so the, it's these kinds of, uh, it's these kinds of uh, things that we want to probe with these simulations. And, and we, we can, of course, encode all kinds of patterns and, and sort of optimal decision sequences, and then see if our, if our model is able to find those optimal sequences. So that's of course, I mean, like real world data, I mean, like, like it's, it's really hard to say what, what kind of like patterns are in the data, but when we get to encode those patterns yourself, then you know that, okay, so that's, that's what the model should be able to learn. Cool. Thanks. It's like kind of like a unit test for, for the implementation in, in a simulator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we still have a few, few more minutes for, for questions. Any other questions? Okay, so it seems that there's no, no more questions. So then I would like to thank the speaker for a really, really cool presentation. And I'd like to also thank the, the audience for your attention. And we will uh, also meet next week uh, with, with another presentation. So thanks everyone and have a nice day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.